You were telling me a little bit about the Rife microscope and how Rife was able to resolve organisms as small as a virus, which is previously thought impossible. Well, actually, uh, I think you've read some of my write-ups where I've talked about it being an interference device. But there was a, a principle that Einstein put out one time, and it's uh, everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I don't know, somehow that got me going, and I woke up one morning, and it just hit me like a flash, which oftentimes inspiration does. And that's that Rife was completely forthcoming about what he did with his microscope. And there really is no mystery. And I'm going to go through that right now uh, and try and make it very clear. The main problem, Tim, that you have with transmission electroscopy, that, uh, transmission microscopy, and that is where you have an object on the tray and you put light underneath and you have two bacteria that are sitting on the tray. And when that light comes through, what happens is if your bacteria are too close, the light interferes because the wavelength of the light is the similar realm as the size of the bacteria. And so that limits your resolution for uh, optical microscopy. It's called the Abbey limit to about uh, 2000x. Well, Reif said that I take and I have a virus or a, an organism that I put on my microscope tray and then I find the frequency at which it fluoresces. And he did that because he had a ultraviolet source that was broadband, but he had a couple of quartz prisms and he had a ultraviolet uh, spectrophotometer. And he would narrow in on the self-fluorescent frequency for the organism, which you can do with a 600 uh, power microscope, even for viruses, because you'll start seeing some sorts of effect that indicate that it's fluorescent. Now, once he did that, that's the key. And the second key is uh, just a, a factor about microscopy that's very easy to demonstrate with a uh, laser and a magnifying glass. Because, uh, take a look at the wall over there. There's the laser spot. Okay? Now, I'll put the laser spot through the magnifying glass here. And I have to get close enough to give you enough power. Can you see that? How that's expanded by a factor of about, oh, 20 or so? Yeah. yeah. Now, when I take and put successive uh, convex lenses together, as in a microscope, I can get my 2,000 power. Actually, however, if I take an objective from a microscope and put it on the ceiling here, for example, what's surprising is that I get, like, maybe 10,000 power just from a 100 power objective if I'm looking at it at what they call an aperture or a distance of like six feet or so. Okay. Well, Rife needed to do this, so what he had inside his microscope was a set of prisms that went back and forth, and in his tube that was about this long, fundamentally he had this much aperture or transmission distance, and so it allowed that beam to spread out and give him the 60,000 magnification. But, of course, the problem is, if I do that with just straight optics, what's the limitation that I get? I can expand the beam as much as I want, but the limitation on my resolution is caused by what, Tim? Interference. Okay, so, interference is a real problem. So how do I get by without having that interference problem? And the answer works like this. When Rife found that self fluorescent frequency, which by the way, Dr. Hell, Stephen Hell, H E L L, it doesn't mean the same thing in German, Max Fike Institute, a lot of papers on breaking the Abbey limit, and he use, uses tagged fluorescent materials. And by having the things fluorescing under laser stimulation, he gets fundamentally an effect that's very much like this in terms of avoiding the interference or using the interference and fundamentally doing a, a, a inverse uh, Fourier transform on the interference to get the interference out and then resolve uh, what he's looking at with exotic methods. But there's one more simple method to do it and that is to recognize that if you're self-fluorescing from a major protein in a virus, for example, and viruses have characteristic proteins in their shells, and they'll self-fluoresce at one particular frequency. 
But when they do that, what happens is the emissions are always photons. The basic emission is a photon, not a wave. And what you can do is you can take and lower the amount of stimulation so that you get one photon on one side of the virus, it goes off. And then another photon goes off over here, kind of a random distribution. And if they go into an objective lens and a tree and start spreading out, there's a third dimension we have to consider here, the Z dimension separated by time. And in fact, if you go to the amount of photons produced per second, standard stuff for, for fluorescence, and take the size of the viruses, you can figure out that you can illuminate to a realm where every photon that's coming off is separated not by like a half micron and could interfere because of the wavelength that it's coming off at, but it's separated by several inches as it goes up the optics path and once it's separated by that Z direction the spread that you have of the beam is such that after the first few inches it is separated in the XY direction that it will not interfere. Now you've said that one of the keys to this was uh, him letting his eyes dark adjust and using right. a vibration free platform. Right? Yes, exactly. Because you see dark adjust. Let's talk about dark adjust. And that is to say that when you are completely dark adjusted, we're talking about an hour, what you can do is you can resolve a single photon. And the uh, proof of this is the work that was done by uh, uh, Rutherford sizing the nucleus using alpha emissions that were hitting a gold foil. And his students look at a f uh, fluorescent screen it was about like this and they sat there putting dots down on a piece of paper as they saw individual flashes, which were the photons from the alpha particle being bent by the gold nucleus and hitting the screen. And then he back calculated the distribution and then found the size of the nucleus. This would be 1904. So we've known this for over 100 years. Uh, the astronauts would go to sleep and they have a little problem. Cosmic rays deposit in their eyeballs and they see flashes all the time that they're out in the Van Allen belt because they get a lot of cosmic rays that come in and stimulate those single photons. It's, I forget they have a fancy name for it, but it's just the single photons. So dark adjusted, you not only can see the single photon, but when you have enough of them, and you can calculate that there's quite enough coming from the low uh, level of stimulation that Rife was using, you can start assembling in your mind, you'll assemble the object and you'll be able to resolve viruses, interior details of bacteria. Now the other question that you have to ask though is what about Rife's ray device? Uh, you know, what, uh, how did that come about? Well, I can't give you all the steps by which Rife came about with it, but I can tell you one thing and that's that, let's take a look here. Now, this is a paper that's available, it's called Giant Vesicles and Electric Fields, so people can look it up using Google. And these authors, and I've communicated with one of them, and she's a very intelligent and wonderful person, understands a lot of what they're doing. What they did is they took various electrical fields put in by various means into petri dishes. And they did various frequencies, pulses, etc. And it's interesting, 5 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, they got different results depending upon frequencies. And you can see that's audio to radio frequency. Take a look here. The giant vesicles are synthetic cell walls. Uh, they can be made and made in a controlled manner. And what they were able to do was obtain all sorts of shapes depending upon the stimulation. And so this technical paper goes through a lot of technical details. Look at this, they made them into squares. Okay. Uh, and they also found, and I think there's one in here, yes, they could stimulate poration in the vesicles, that is, break holes in, and that's the destruction of the cells, and that's what Rife was doing with his device. And that's the Rife Ray device. That's the Rife Ray device, and the Rife Ray device, if you look up any of the work by Dr. Bear, a chiropractor, but very good technically, you'll find that uh, what he says is, oh yeah, uh, he says when you stimulate that uh, uh, helium and argon, uh, no, helium and neon gas with the uh, 
uh, CB frequency, the result is essentially a low-grade maser. You get out all sorts of microwave frequencies. And then what Reif did is he just simply amplitude modulated that, AM, with various audio frequencies, and he found that he would get in various audio frequencies. Remember that first picture, 5 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz? There were effects that are had all in that range. So fundamentally, the uh, uh, microwave frequency is just a carrier, and the frequency that actually causes effects is the audio overlay. And unlike this, where they had to use some electrodes in solutions to do most of these effects, this is a way to be able to put that driving force directly into tissue, for example, human tissue, which is what Reif claimed, that he had frequencies for various organisms, and he could cause them to porate or self-destruct, whereas not damaging other parts of human tissue. So he could find specific things for viruses and bacteria, and they all have key frequency signatures. So I think what I've done here, as you can see, we've gone from the mystery of the microscope and Rife being able to actually observe the interior bacteria, the functioning of bacteria, the effects of his device, to the Rife ray device, which unfortunately that trivializes it. It's a bona fide technology known as Maser technology, which in the 30s, of course, Rife was incredibly ahead of his time for the fluorescent aspect and for the uh, aspect of the ray device being a modulated maser that causes these sorts of effects on single cell organisms and can be used for therapeutic value in the human body. And I think what we have here, uh, would you agree that we've gone through point by point and with this discussion none of it's a mystery.